and we're back. So, uh, part three, yeah, they would ask for death qualification if I was sitting in the jury pool during voir dire. They would say, do you have anything that would prevent you from giving the death penalty? And I'd say, I morally cannot give the death penalty. Uh, I don't believe the killing of someone in this context is right. And they would say, okay, you're dismissed. So notice what happens now. Everyone who is fundamentally opposed to the death penalty and won't hand out the death penalty will not be on the jury. And that's what's called death qualification. Death qualification is all jurors must be willing to give the death penalty in a death penalty case. And, and you know, it makes a practical sense, right? Because if you find out that I won't give the death penalty no matter what you do in the trial, the death penalty will not be given because it will not be unanimous because I will stand out against it. So, it makes sense, but then we ask, okay, so it makes sense, but what are the consequences of this process? And that is, so now we have a jury of people who have declared they are willing to give the death penalty if they believe it's warranted, right? The, the idea here is it's blatantly tilted in, in favor of the prosecution. Someone who can't vote for it's excluded, but someone who can is included. So the prosecution does kind of get a leg up. The defense is <laughs> relying on people who won't give the death penalty, and all those people have been eliminated. So all else being equal, yes, the prosecution has been given an advantage. Now, we can argue to what extent that exists as an advantage. Well, why is it a problem? Well, because the bias isn't just about the penalty phase. The bias seems to, according to research, bleed over into the determination of guilt as well. So what we see then uh, is it favors the prosecution, mistrustful of defendants, and are more punitive. Right? So let's, let's play out the study here. Study with two types of mock juries, just death qualified jurors or mixed set of jurors. So let's suppose that the death qualification process wasn't in existence. We just had mixed jurors, right? And then versus what a jury would be generated through death qualification. Each type of jury heard the same evidence. So we have parallel mock trials, right? But death qualified juries found the defendant guilty 75% of the time. Mixed juries found the defendant guilty 53% of the time. So ultimately, the whole goal of bifurcating the trial to restore the death penalty back in the 70s was to separate the guilt process from the penalty phase. But what we see is, by using the process as death qualification, we've essentially recombined them and are no longer realizing the intent of the abolition of the death penalty in the first place. So that, that's kind of, you know, uh, problematic, if, if you will. So who isn't death qualified? What do these folks look like? Well, they're more likely to be black and they're more likely to be women who are not going to go along with the death penalty. But obviously there's exceptions, there's individual differences. Lockhart versus McCree, the American Psychological Association developed a brief against death qualification. They summarized 30 years of evidence, right? And the Supreme Court said, look, and again, this is kind of the fourth dilemma. The psychologists have all this science and all this empirical research under the belt, but the, the courts, the Supreme Court, people in the legal profession, dance into a different drummer, and, and they say, hey, look, as long as people say they'll be conscientious and, and find the fact, that's all that matters. This research, we're not so impressed. And, and so, you know, science takes a back seat to tradition. Uh, tradition and or, and let's go back to the beginning of the, of the lecture. What was the primary motivation in, in, in punishment? It was retribution, and if you kill, then you need to be killed, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. So to what extent is science being ignored on the basis of kind of a very primal motivation that many people demonstrate? It's, it's a complex problem, and there's not necessarily easy solutions. The one thing I will say in, in closing about this part of the death penalty is when you make a mistake, it's irreversible. And I provided a lot of evidence that mistakes are made quite often. So are we willing to do that? And it goes back to the beginning of the course because I said, you know, what is your, I asked you guys, what is your error rate? What's an acceptable error rate? You know, in, in social psychology, when we do studies, we do the P equals 0 
and, and what we're saying is if we run this study 20 times, right, nine, you know, 19 times out of 20, this is the result, right, if p is less than 0 0.05 if we choose significance. But there's always that one chance, that 1 in 20 chance when we run this study that will give us uh, the, the false results, right, we'll commit that type 1 error. So, uh, what is your acceptable error rate? 1%, half a percent, never, and I know no one wanted to answer that question when I asked you in class because it's a nasty question. That's a genuine nasty question. <laughs> Alright, so, uh, and I mean people love their death penalty, uh, and that's it. A lot of people love the death penalty. Execution marathon planned in Arkansas. This was about two years ago. Arkansas Governor Asa Hutchinson defended his decision to put to death seven prisoners over 11-day period starting on, on, on that Monday. And there's a link if, if you want to look at, at the history of the story. But people love it, and, and they embrace the death penalty, and they want to go after people. And, and, you know, obviously there's a lot of states in the South, predominantly, that still just bang the drum for their death penalty. West Coast, not so much. Look, uh, California just put, not too long ago, a moratorium on the death penalty. Illinois put a, a moratorium on the death penalty. Um, there's people in Arizona that have been on death row for going on 25, 30 years. And, and that in itself is kind of strange when you think about it. So it will remain controversial. Uh, hopefully we can step back, we can look at the research, we can look at the data and, and make maybe an empirically based decision rather than a viscerally based decision, but that's hoping for a lot. Okay. Yeah. So are there other types of justice? Well, yeah. Uh, there's restorative justice, seeks to repair the harm caused by the crime. So and you can check it out in restorative uh, justice org and, and check that link if you want. Data on incarceration, what do we know? U.S. federal correction facilities estimated million and a half prisoners back in, uh, in December of 2013, right? Uh, an increase of 4,300 prisoners from the year end. Uh, we keep seeing prison population. We've developed the reputation since this data as being incarceration nation. The United States incarcerates more than, than any other industrialized nation. We incarcerate more than just about anyone on the planet on, on a per capita basis. We love to lock people up in the United States. That's kind of our deal, I guess. Uh, the further data on incarceration, number of persons in Senate, Senate's more than one year, uh, increased number of persons admitted to state, federal prison, increased 4%. Okay. Uh, recidivism, within three years, 65% of psychopaths in the sample reoffended with only 25% of non-psychopaths. So if we can identify psychopaths, we might look at uh, the higher probability for re recidivism if we're looking at early release and those kinds of things. Uh, treated psychopaths, high in factor one, reoffended at higher rates than non-treated. And, and Herod all have, have really questioned since they're like the experts on, on psychopathy, you know, uh, at least in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, treatment doesn't appear to work. Uh, damage control is more the direction they're moving now. Info and their meta-analysis found psychopaths to offend an average of, of rate of 3 to 1 over non-psychopaths, 75% uh, increase, right? So, uh, I want to now put in a video here uh, and I'll also well, you, you can you can search it if you want. It's, it's a fascinating story, so let, let's put this on here. Uh, and it's how jails extort the poor. Remember that what happens when you're arrested and you're awaiting trial is if you don't get bail, you sit there and you wait in jail until your trial time. So when we look at city and county jails, most of the people in city and county jails are not there because they've been convicted of a crime. They're waiting for their trials. How does this work, and how does it extort the poor? One summer afternoon in 2013, D.C. police detained, questioned, and searched a man who appeared suspicious and potentially dangerous. 
This wasn't what I was wearing the day of the detention, to be fair, but I have a picture of that as well. I know it's very frightening. Try to remain calm. <laughs> at this time, at this time, I was interning at the Public Defender Service in Washington, D.C., and I was uh, visiting a police station for work. I was on my way out, and before I could make it to my car, two police cars pulled up to block my exit, and an officer approached from behind. Sorry about that. He told me to stop, take my backpack off, and put my hand on the police car parked next to us. About a dozen officers then gathered near us. All of them had handguns, some had assault rifles. They uh, rifled through my backpack, they patted me down. They took pictures of me spread on the police car, and they laughed. And as all this was happening, as I was on the police car, trying to ignore the shaking in my legs, trying to think clearly about what I should do, something stuck out to me as odd. When I look at myself in this photo, if I were to describe myself, I think I'd say something like, 19-year-old Indian male, bright t-shirt, wearing glasses. But they weren't including any of these details. Into their police radios, as they described me, they kept saying, Middle Eastern male with a backpack. Middle Eastern male with a backpack. And this description carried on into their police reports. I never expected to be described by my own government in these terms. Lurking, nefarious, terrorist. And the detention dragged on like this. They sent dogs trained to smell explosives to sweep the area I'd been in. They called the federal government to see if I was on any watch list. They sent a couple of detectives to cross-examine me on why, if I claimed I had nothing to hide, I wouldn't consent to a search of my car. And I could see they weren't happy with me, but I felt I had no way of knowing what they'd want to do next. At one point, the officer who patted me down scanned the side of the police station to see where the security camera was, to see how much of this was being recorded. And when he did that, it really sank in how completely I was at their mercy. And I think we're all normalized from a young age to the idea of police officers and arrests and handcuffs. So it's easy to forget how demeaning and coercive a thing it is to seize control. Of. else. What I have in mind is how much worse things might have been if I weren't affluent. I mean, they thought I might be trying to plant an explosive, and they investigated that possibility for an hour and a half, but I was never put in handcuffs. I was never taken to a jail cell. I think if I were from one of Washington, D.C.'s poor communities of color, and they thought I was endangering officers' lives, things might have ended differently. And in fact, in our system, I think it's better to be an affluent person suspected of trying to blow up a police station than it is to be a poor person who's suspected of much, much less than this. And I want to give you an example from my current work. Right now, I'm working at a civil rights organization in D.C. called Equal Justice Under Law. Let me start by uh, asking you all a question. How many of you have ever gotten a parking ticket in your life? Raise your hand. Yeah, so have I. Um, and when I had to pay it, it felt annoying and it felt bad, but I paid it and I moved on. I'm guessing most of you have paid your tickets as well. But what would happen if you couldn't afford the amount on the ticket? And your family doesn't have the money either. What happens then? Um, well, one thing that's not supposed to happen under the law is you're not supposed to be arrested and jailed simply because you can't afford to pay. That's illegal under federal law. But that's what local governments across the country are doing to people who are poor. And so many of our lawsuits at Equal Justice Under Law target these modern-day debtors' prisons. One of our cases is against Ferguson, Missouri. And I know when I say Ferguson, many of you will think of police violence. But today I want to talk about a different aspect of the relationship between their police force and their citizens. Ferguson was issuing an average of over two arrest warrants per person per year, mostly for unpaid debt to the courts. When I imagine what that would feel like if every time I left my house, there was a chance a police officer would run my license plate, see a warrant for unpaid debt, seize my body the way they did in D.C., and then take me to a jail cell, I feel a little sick. And I've met many of the people in Ferguson who have experienced this, and I've heard some of their stories. In Ferguson's jail, in each small cell, there's a bunk bed and a toilet, but they'd pack four people into each cell. So there'd be two people on the bunks and two people on the floor, one with nowhere to go except right next to the filthy toilet, which was never cleaned. And in fact, the whole cell was never cleaned, so the floor and the walls were lined with blood and mucus. 
no water to drink except coming out of a spigot connected to the toilet the water looked and tasted dirty there was never enough food never any showers women menstruating without any hygiene products no medical attention whatsoever when I asked a woman about medical attention she laughed and she said oh no no the only attention you get from the guards in there is sexual so they take the debtors to this place and they'd say we're not letting you leave until you make a payment on your debt and if you could if you could call a family member who could somehow come up with some money then maybe you were out if there was enough money you were out but if it wasn't then you'd stay there for days or weeks and every day the guards would come down to the cells and haggle with the debtors about the price of release that day and you'd stay until at some point the jail would be booked to capacity and they'd want to book someone new in and at that point they'd think okay it's unlikely this person can come up with the money it's more likely this new person will you're out there in and the machine kept moving like that I met a man who nine years ago was arrested for panhandling in a Walgreens he couldn't afford his fines and his court fees from that case when he was young he survived a house fire only because he jumped out of the third story window to escape but that fall left him with damage to his brain and several parts of his body including his legs so he can't work and he relies on social security payments to survive when I met him in his apartment he had nothing of value there not even food in his fridge he's chronically hungry he had nothing of value in his apartment except a small piece of cardboard on which he'd written the names of his children he cherished this a lot he was happy to show it to me but he can't pay his fines and fees because he has nothing to give but in the last nine years he's been arrested 13 times and jailed for a total of 130 days on that panhandling case one of those stretches lasted 45 days so just imagine spending from right now until sometime in june in the place that i described to you a few moments ago he told me about all the suicide attempts he's seen in ferguson's jail about the time a man found a way to hang himself out of reach of the other inmates so all they could do was yell and yell and yell trying to get the guards attention so they could come down and cut him down and he told me that it took the guards over five minutes to respond and when they came the man was unconscious so they called the paramedics and the paramedics went to the cell they said he'll be okay so they just left him there on the floor i heard many stories like this and they shouldn't have surprised me because suicide is the single leading cause of death in our local jails this is related to the lack of mental health care in our jails. I met a woman, single mother of three, making $7 an hour. She relies on food stamps to feed herself and her children. And about a decade ago, she got a couple of traffic tickets and a minor theft charge. And she can't afford her fines and fees on those cases. And since then, she's been jailed about 10 times on those cases. But she has schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, and she needs medication every day. She doesn't have access to those medications in Ferguson's jail because no one has access to their medications. And so she told me about what it was like to spend two weeks in a cage, hallucinating people in shadows and hearing voices, begging for the medication that would make it all stop, but only to be ignored. And this isn't anomalous either. 30% of women in our local jails have serious mental health needs just like hers, but only one in six receive any mental health care while in jail. And so I heard all these stories about this grotesque dungeon that Ferguson was operating for its debtors. And when it came time for me to actually see it and to go visit Ferguson's jail, I'm not sure what I was expecting to see, but I wasn't expecting this. It's an ordinary government building. It could be a post office or a school. And it reminded me that these illegal extortion schemes aren't being run somewhere in the shadows. They're being run out in the open by our public officials. They're a matter of public policy. And this reminded me that poverty jailing in general, even outside the debtors' prison context, plays a very visible and central role in our justice system. What I have in mind is our policy of bail. In our system, whether you're detained or free pending trial is not a matter of how dangerous you are or how much of a flight risk you pose. It's a matter of whether you can afford to post your bail amount. And so Bill Cosby, whose bail was set at a million dollars, immediately writes the check and doesn't spend a second in a jail cell. The Sandra Bland, who died in jail, was only there because her family was unable to come up with $500. And in fact, there are half a million Sandra Blands across the country, 500,000 people who are in jail right now, only because they can't afford their bail amount. We're told that our jails are places for criminals, but statistically that's not the case. Three out of every five people in jail right now are there pre-trial. They haven't been 
convicted of any crime, they haven't pled guilty to any offense. Right here in San Francisco, 85% of the inmates in our jail in San Francisco are pretrial detainees. This means San Francisco is spending something like $80 million every year to fund pretrial detention. And many of these people who are in jail only because they can't post bail are facing allegations so minor that the amount of time it would take for them to sit waiting for trial is longer than the sentence they'd receive if convicted which means they're guaranteed to get out faster if they just plead guilty. And so now the choice is, should I stay here in this horrible place, away from my family and my dependents, almost guaranteed to lose my job, and then fight the charges, or should I just plead guilty to whatever the prosecutor wants and get out? And at this point, they're pretrial detainees, not criminals. But once they take that plea deal, we'll call them criminals, even though an affluent person would never have been in this situation, because an affluent person would have simply been bailed out. And so at this point, you might be wondering, this guy's in the inspiration section, what, what is he doing? This is, <laughs> this is extremely depressing. I want my money back. <laughs> but in actuality, I find uh, talking about jailing much less depressing than the alternative. Because I think if we don't talk about these issues and collectively change how we think about jailing, at the end of all of our lives, we'll still have jails full of poor people who don't belong there. That really is depressing to me. But what's exciting to me is the thought that these stories can move us to think about jailing in different terms, not in sterile policy terms like mass incarceration or sentencing of nonviolent offenders, but in human terms. When we put a human being in a cage for days or weeks or months or even years, what are we doing to that person's mind and body? Under what conditions are we really willing to do that? And so if starting with the few hundred of us in this room, we can commit to thinking about jailing in this different light, and we can undo that normalization I was referring to earlier. So if I leave you with anything today, I hope it's with the thought that if we want anything to fundamentally change, not just to reform our policies on bail and fines and fees, but also to make sure that whatever new policies replace those don't punish the poor and the marginalized in their own new way. If we want that kind of change, then this shift in thinking is required of each of us. Thank you. And when we look at discussion board three, as, as I get rid of this for us, uh, well, this is going fine. When, when, I, when we look at discussion board three, let's consider then uh, what reforms, you know, and how will you know that those reforms are doing well, uh, is something that we need to consider in, in that regard. So I'm going to shut us down here for the minute and then come back. <laughs>